areas to you. Uh, I'm Dave Ferguson, Dean of the College, and we've been meeting with, um, with uh, leadership and, and some faculty and students over the last year or so, uh, trying to fine tune and, and bring you topics that are of interest to you. I would just say to you that uh, if you have interest areas, as students in particular, please make your, your chair, uh, department chair, aware of that, because we really are wanting to, uh, to tailor as much as we can to, to the interests that are in our community. So uh, it's my pleasure to launch this uh, lecture by introducing Josh Cogatel, who is a faculty member in the Department of Architecture, who will introduce our speaker. Can you guys hear me? All right, thank you. Uh, so we're very lucky today uh, to have Jennifer Bonner, uh, founder of Wall. Um, yeah, it was she founded in 2019, a, pr a practice that cross cross-passes both architecture and art. Some quick background, Jennifer has attended Auburn University's Royal Studio. Uh, she worked in London for Lord Norman Crossley. Received her master's degree from Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. She's taught at diverse institutions such as Woodbury University, Georgia Tech, and she's currently the director of Harvard University's post-professional program. Her latest book, A Guide to the Dirty South, reclaims and reimagines a new identity for our southern capital of Atlanta. And in my opinion, she is an effective and emerging leader of a new generation of architects, as evidenced by her massive amounts of press, exhibitions, and cross-country lecture tour going on this year alone. Ms. Bonner has a disciplinary approach to everyday architecture and to resulting material practice. Her work is playful, but do not make the mistake that it has serious scholarship or influential. A quick thanks to Professor Thank you, Josh. Um, uh, thank you for having me uh, today to lecture uh, at your school and share uh, some of the work. Um, this is my first time in Indiana, um, and it's been, everyone's been very hospitable. And I feel like because you're really close to Kentucky, um, maybe there's something there. Um, it feels kind of southern. I felt at home in the past two days. So, um, so just to start, uh, the fonts are going to look a little weird. This is because we did a last minute computer switcheroo. Um, but most schools of architecture um, often ask for your lecture title in advance, and you're really not ready to send it. Um, and so, you know, I, I sent this title forward, House Gables, or I usually send a title that says, like, Why Roofs Are Good. Um, and I don't want to overwhelm everyone with the real title, which is this one. Video, I hope you can play. Oh, it's playing, but there's no sound. I don't know if we're able to get that. Yeah, I'm not going to try to. Imagine a clicking typewriter or the keyboard. Uh, so this is the real um, title of the uh, lecture. It can hardly um, fit on the slide, um, and it will probably cause a little problem for the school's archiving uh, of the lecture series. Um, <clears throat> but it's important because it demonstrates a number of ideas uh, involved in designing and constructing a 2,200 square foot um, house, which I'm going to show. Um, if I could unpack a capital P pro uh, project for my practice, I would do so on the work uh, on the ordinary, found in domestic cats on the left. Uh, and House Gables on the right. Um, <clears throat> ordinary architecture obviously is not my term, but someone, you know, folks like Venturi Scott Brown used it often. Um, and I see this work sitting in a larger lineage uh, inside of architecture. And I might even suggest something like Dirty Ordinary, which I'll speak about um, when I present work on the Dirty South Guidebook. Um, so the goal is to take something what might be abstract or conceptual uh, and flip it into a real building as seen in this slide. My work often begins with a question rather than a sketch. Uh, it relates directly to popular culture. It is graphic um, and it takes cues uh, from art practice. So House Gables is a conceptual project around 87 cross-laminated timber panels. 
It's also about three representational models. This is one of them, the dollhouse. Um, 1,700 square feet of glitter stucco, 10 faux finishes, uh, and a proposal for what I'm calling a roof plan ideology. So this is a suggestion for how we might shift away from uh, the free plan and the ROM plan. Um, but to start, to start out, um, MAL stands for Mass Architectural Loop-de-Loops. Um, and so the acronym obviously is a 20th century Americanism in wide circulation. Americans love their shorthand. Um, and this is what MAL um, looks like sitting in a sea of known acronyms outside of our discipline, ranging from things like governmental agencies uh, and digital technology to best social media practices, um, OMG. Um, and this is Mall sitting in a sea of other architectural practices that also use acronyms, firms like Foster and Partners and David Chipperfield Architects, which were my, uh, as mentioned, was my former employers in, in London. But Mall also means this kind of mall, and this is the firm, uh, sorry, this is the uh, uh, building that I spent a lot of time in growing up in Huntsville, Alabama. Um, so Mall uses short form uh, as a way of allowing the long form name to change from month to month, or as our architectural interest uh, shift from each project. Uh, Mall is interested in an intellectual project, um, not a formal project, which is to say that the architecture for each project tends to look differently, um, meaning that there's not a formula for how to, to kind of make it. Um, Mall can also mean um, miniature angles and little lines, or maximum arches with limited liability. And obviously, we add a C on the end if we want to fill professional LLC. Um, <clears throat> But before uh, introducing the work on the ordinary and house gables, I'm going to quickly flip through some of the tendencies in the work um, uh, as an academic uh, practitioner. Um, I think academic ar uh, architects tend to kind of misbehave more so than professional offices. Um, and so I think it's important to see how this gets played out in gallery installations, research, publications, um, and experiments in the public realm. So the next five projects um, we kind of call um, Mall's Five Best Practices. Um, and so the very first one, number one, fly for drones and synchronization scanning Mises, House Longa, and House Esters. So they're supposed to be sound, but basically you'll hear like you would hear a soft uh, uh, hum of two drones. And I'd don't know if it's working. It's hard to see. Yep, it's working. Um, okay, so this is uh, House Longer, House Esters. They're located in Krefeld, Germany. Um, they're, they're Mises, two houses with two different clients on two different sites. Uh, there's what I would call the two famous elevations, which are the rear <laughs> elevations. Um, and what I proposed was to take two drones and have them in synchronization scanning the facades. Um, there's actually two other drones that are filming the two drones doing all the work. Um, and these houses aren't twins, I would say they're something like doubles. And the two things that are holding them together would be obviously these brick facades and these large picture windows. And so when looking at this project, there's actually a lot of steel in the walls uh, in order to get these very large picture windows. And so in 1930s, uh, this is, you know, he's not building load masonry, uh, load bearing masonry walls. I'm saying Mises bricks are fake in this sense. Um, so again, this is a research project and I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do with it. I get uh, back in the studio, basically uh, the image on the left, was a, which is a digital point cloud, 3D scan, and it's what I'm calling a bad mesh, meaning it's not precise, it's messy. Um, and then here are the three ingredients that I start stringing together. Uh, the middle is a bitmap, um, a bad bitmap, and then a bad bump map. So these are the three ingredients that I'm putting together. And uh, just taking a bitmap and like making a rendering of the, this digital mesh, um, this is the kind of image that I'm interested in, which is architect's blue foam. 
being wallpapered. You can see all the seams. And I'm thinking about early renderings uh, and what those early renderings uh, looked like, which was like bad seams from the materials being applied. Um, we're much further along now, but it's interesting to kind of look at it at, at this moment. And so this is my palette of materials. Instead of um, Mises brick, I'm exchanging them for white bricks with pink grout, uh, uh, wood scallops in lilac, or OSB board, which is kind of tinted uh, neon yellow. And so the idea here is to exchange Mises bricks with this other material palette. And these are some of the renderings that we uh, produced. And so now I'm interested in taking this and actually building materials that are made from a rendering, if that makes any uh, sense. This, here are some of the images that were made. And this is going to be, if you have time to make it over to Kent State, uh, Kent, Ohio, this will be an exhibition uh, starting in November to January of this year. <clears throat> Number two, make public space that is strange. Um, this was a, uh, a project where I was asked to uh, make a project on Boston's Greenway. Um, if any of you are familiar with the Greenway, basically they took all the roads and made, dug them all and put them all underground. It's called the Big Dig. And so now they're trying to populate uh, this greenscape with events and public art. Uh, so this was the architecture design biennial where five architects um, installed work uh, temporarily two summers ago. The project's called Another Axon. And here I'm asking the question, is a drawing architecture? Can you make an architecture that is a drawing? So this is a kind of a thesis question, right? Um, and so that gets played out in a series of ways. Obviously this whole uh, Installation is kind of built around a view from a six-story parking garage. And so when you're standing at this precise moment, you see the axon, axonometric kind of perfect view. The drawing comes out in kind of digitally in uh, the kind of tooling pass and the drawings that we're um, making onto some of the materials. So you have synthetic turf on the right and synthetic stucco uh, on the left. Um, and this is where the projects, I think, is kind of easy. Uh, we're taking 3D uh, dimensional models from online, and I'm scanning the catalog, and I'm taking only uh, conceptual, I'm sorry, minimalist art from the 60s and 70s. And so we're taking uh, Donald Judd, Carl Andre, uh, and those are the white, um, those are the white forms you see there. And then we're skewing them in our kind of axon machine. Um, this is the Greenway. Uh, and we were, we were asked to select a site, and I tried to pick like what I would consider, like, again, a bad site, because I knew that I could scatter out on this landscape. In other parts, the grass was more precious and more contained, and it would be more difficult to uh, kind of make a scatter plan. Um, this is the front view of the project, and, and bad because this is the off-ramp to the I-93, which is underground, so cars are coming up, and you're, they're basically sitting in traffic uh, looking at this view, which is the, the back side. And you can see how drawing gets played out three-dimensionally uh, in the way that the final siding is being hung on the forms. Um, and then you see that six-story parking garage, uh, the very corner is where the, the project kind of is able to be seen. Um, this is a plan drawing of the project, which looks like an axonometric to me. This is a perspective, uh, which is an axonometric. And then for a project titled Another Axon, I thought it was important to actually make a true axonometric drawing, which is, which is this image. And then obviously, we, if you're building something in the public realm, you're seeing how it gets played out um, uh, and then how it shows up on media and so that's how um, the two people that are getting married in the first slide um, I just found that on Instagram somewhere so it was kind of that picture was kind of more important to me than the one the architectural photographs that I'd taken with a photographer um, number three throw a picnic for architecture um, so this is a project called um, best sandwiches and it's concerned with extrusions and, how question, and questions how architecture uh, and sandwiches might stack. 
the project's also about a picnic blanket. It's a thin, wrinkled surface, and it connotes whimsy and delight rather than firmness and weight. After all, the picnic blanket is a temporary ground. Um, once the sandwiches are consumed, the picnic blanket could be picked up, shaken off, and easily moved. The picnic blanket is not a representation of the city grid or another super surface um, from the 70s. It's merely a picnic blanket. Uh, so clearly, um, the sandwich is ubiquitous in popular culture. Every city and town is vying for kind of the best sandwich, whether it's pastrami or BLTs. And I'm interested in all three versions, which is the first one is the Google search. Oh, the font is just not good. Um, the Google search where I found the Dagwood in 2016. The middle one is uh, Klaus Oldenburg's uh, giant BLT from 63. And then the last one, obviously, is um, our rendition, uh, which is a BLT, um, also in 2016. So the desire here is to use the sandwich and it stacks beyond the metaphor. Um, and I'll try to talk through this. It often takes a lot of, uh, it takes a certain amount of sandwich know-how uh, to make an architectural stack. Uh, color is important uh, when making the stack. And then color in combination with the deployment of many types of apertures is intentional. Um, they promote a legibility of repeating layers. So this is a grilled cheese with two different kinds of cheese. Uh, the sandwich stack offers us multiple grounds as a result of multiple elevations. Uh, so you no longer have one north elevation, you have like five or six north elevations. This is a sub sandwich. And so in architectural stacks, there's no single ground upon which a unified figure sits. Instead, uh, these stratified buildings propose a multiplicity of grounds, a multiplicity of figures, uh, slicing elevations into a series of horizontal figures. Um, and then there's kind of endless stacking possibilities. Uh, this is a shot, so we did nine sandwiches as a collection, um, and then I took it over to a food photographer's studio in Boston, um, and he had all these plates in his uh, studio, and so we uh, shot, we photographed the work uh, on his plates, which makes sense. So you don't go to the architectural photographer, do it yourself, you like join up with the food photographer. And this is the work exhibited at the Pink Comma Gallery in Boston. And then if I follow the recipe, what I mentioned in the beginning, um, the idea is to then take one of these and turn it into a real building. Um, and so this was uh, two summers ago uh, where we tried to look at it as a mid-rise tower. Um, and this is the project that won a Progressive Architecture Award um, where we're looking at uh, how an office tower might have different tenants as they do in different levels um, and what would combine some of these layers, so lettuce and tomato, would be these kind of mini atria that connect various floors together. And then if you think about how a tower works, you know, uh, the tenant that has the largest leasehold and the most uh, square footage would have their uh, brand at the top, like KPMG or, you know, Price Waterhouse Cooper or whatever, uh, and so in this case, there's a there's a you're able to uh, kind of sell multiple facades and multiple um, naming or branding opportunities. Okay, um, number four, question how architectural models are displayed. Um, as an assistant professor at the Graduate School of Design at Harvard, I was asked to be the faculty editor of a publication there called Platform. And this is the uh, school's kind of uh, yearbook, let's say, for students. And so the dean at the time uh, really asked the faculty member to somehow look at the work of the school and uh, edit the pedagogy of the school somehow in a book. And with the 900 person, uh, situation. It, it's pretty difficult to think about how to edit the entire school and combine it into uh, kind of a thoughtful position. Um, and so I'm doing two things here. The book is called Still Life, 
uh, where I'm using the still life as a robust artistic medium. Um, so I'm turning to art practice uh, and using it as a device to organize the work of the school. It was also uh, reprinted the following year at Tongji University Press um, and is kind of out in the world now. This is, uh, the second thing I'm doing is adding uh, color temporarily to the models. Um, so in each of the still life, um, I'll show in just a minute, uh, we're, art, we're temporarily throwing color onto the work as a way of unifying it. And so we made 16 different still lifes and we're arranging the work. So here you might see an architectural thesis project beside a landscape architecture studio. Uh, beside an urban design uh, core studio, for example. And the, the reference that I'm using for color is the work of Barbara Caston, who in the, in the early 80s was uh, arranging still lifes kind of in her studio and using colored gels, so colored gels in front of lights, which are being cross-thrown uh, onto the work. Um, and so I'm trying to bring that technique into architecture. Um, and it's offering up kind of a demonstration project to the students who, whose models largely, when I arrived, were uh, brown chipboard and cardboard and white foam core and white 3D prints. And so I knew I couldn't um, physically change the student's model or paint them, but I could temporarily do it with colored light. And so the idea is to try to shake up the school and. Uh, uh, put some pink in there somehow. Um, number five uh, would, is create a discourse around architecture of the dirty south uh, via via guidebook. Um, so as mentioned, this was a studio I taught at Georgia Tech in Atlanta. Um, and I, I started the studio by putting um, uh, the history of like hip hop and the rap industry from the mid 90s out to the students, so uh, if we think about uh, those artists, um, there was clearly an East Coast and West Coast camp, there was a rivalry, uh, and if we uh, think about what Goody Mob and Outcast did in Atlanta, um, we're using that analogy to then think about architecture, because I think it's, um, there's a parallel between the styles, I think, of rap and architecture, and let's say um, thought on architecture. Um, so we weren't really trying to find the architects of the Dirty South, we were trying to find a, a description of architecture there. And we use the guidebook because it's a medium that we can kind of sneak our smart architecture ideas into and then kind of uh, uh, make this a publication that can be used by many. I'm not going to talk about many, but uh, this student, Patrick, uh, made a chapter called Archie Tours where he uh, renamed it and it's called Facade Trafficking. So in Atlanta, he noticed that all the parts of the um, drawings that are black with white lines, these are parts of buildings that facades have been taken down, stored, and then re-put back together in other places of the city. And he found like 11 examples of that, so then that, we would call that a pattern. Um, and just as the guidebook was going to print, um, one of I.M. Pei's, uh, his very first building was actually built in Atlanta, and we just watched this, some contractor like taking it apart. Uh, and so we thought, okay, what are they gonna do with the facade? And they basically put it back together in, in the same site, in the same configuration, and it's a lobby to this um, apartment complex. So these are the kind of oddities and urban patterns that happen in Atlanta. Um, obviously, the work of John Portman is very important uh, in the city, and so a student is documenting all of his super atrium and spaces and tunnels. And this is a proposal uh, by one of the students uh, for like what an architecture would be uh, with like kind of mini atrium, atria uh, all within one superstructure. And then lastly, a student saw that there was a pattern to uh, the tops of buildings in Atlanta. They're all kind of pyramidal. Uh, and this is an example of those, uh, like a dozen or so. So her proposal is to cut off the tops uh, I don't know, hoist, let them fall, I don't know what the strategy was, at the base of the buildings. These would now be public art sculptures, and she proposed a new architecture for the top, so all the lawyers would get kicked out. And this was kind of a top floor urbanism um, to suggest how Atlantans could use the city. 
Um, the guidebook is uh, part tour guide, part architectural manual, um, and, but it's also uh, part oral history. So the students interviewed Big Gip, Cujo, and Timo from Goody Mob. Um, and we were able to talk to John Portman, who's now passed away. So um, it's all on Amazon if you want to find it. The publisher went bankrupt, but some issues like emerged from China on a boat. And I think somebody's selling it on Amazon right now, but I don't know how to get my copies that I signed up for. So, uh, OK, so moving into, that was a long introduction, but um, I think we're good on time. Uh, the rest is going to be the talk on the ordinary in House Gables, as promised. Um, but I think that that kind of shows uh, where I think research questions can start and concepts and abstraction can then pull us into um, uh, real buildings. And so to describe House Gables, I'm going to place emphasis on those three models. The first one being the massing model, the second one the dollhouse model, and the third the one-to-one -one model. Um, ordinary architecture is often overlooked. It's a throwaway. The stuff that is immediately accessible but usually tossed aside. And so I'm asking the question, what is the ordinary and why is it relevant now? Uh, and how might we flip this into a representational project? Um, the ordinary is also what I've termed like, uh, as the contractor stockpile and all things pertaining to the roof. Um, the lingo goes like this, uh, eaves, ridges, valleys, rakes, soffits, gables, hips, dormers. Um, and the literary reference for the co contractor stockpile is Hawthorne's House of Seven Gables, um, and the hashtag uh, is domestic hats. And if we consider the contractor as a geometrist for a moment, um, then it's possible to think about these piles of two by sixes and two by fours uh, as a project of planar inclination. Uh, and I might go as far as to say that these geometries are the American version of the contemporary cathedral, uh, which for pu purposes of a close reading was all about the roof. Uh, and in the contractor stockpile, there's uh, endless uh, variations to the roof pitch, but they're usually under 12 to 12, so you have like 9 to 12, 7 to 12. Um, in, in House Gables, everything is above 12 to 12, so I'm using more extreme pitches, like 14 to 12 or 17 to 12. Uh, this is, you know, the, the catalog of the roofs I just mentioned. Um, and it's so straightforward uh, and commonplace that we tend to forget the spatial opportunities that these roof types produce um, when we flip our thinking about how they might affect the interior. Um, the, the current construction modes uh, from the contractor camp pr promote building vented roofs, yet the unvented roof uh, allows visual connection to what might otherwise be deemed as like attic geometry. So we tend to never see the, the exposed roof in, in this case. Um, <clears throat> The next eight slide, a couple of slides, I'm going to talk about this close reading because I'm not trying to brainwash, but I, I think it's important to show uh, like where these forms came from in, in a serious way um, because I am interested in the kind of fun and uh, the, uh, the ordinary, obviously, but I think we can read these things in a very um, serious manner. And so figure one demonstrates how a gable roof is covered by a hip roof. Figure two uh, is two intersected gables with offset and misaligned shed roofs. Um, chamfered triple hips with asymmetrical uh, extruded gables. This is uh, figure five, stacked, stretched, and clipped gables, also known as the gable stack. Are y'all seeing everything that I'm projecting here? Um, this is one of my favorite, a front-facing gable with a camel-backed hip plus a rotated gable and a mini gable bump in the back. Um, the research began by taking a fairly random sample of 50 houses in Atlanta, because um, that's where I was at the time, and we cut through eight different neighborhoods um, and we noticed a few tendencies about the collection. First, that 
uh, the geometries um, in more affluent neighborhoods were more convoluted, they were elaborate, um, and they were complex, while the lower socioeconomic neighborhoods had more humble roof lines. And so you can see what I'm talking about, Object 21 is in a neighborhood called Buckhead, and so this is about eight roofs being mashed up over one villa to cover a 6,000 square foot plan. And then Object 41, which is in Cabbage Town, is a singular uh, gable roof with a hip on the back. Um, and this is uh, covering a shotgun house. And so I'm interested in actually both conditions and how that might be useful um, uh, when thinking about a new architecture. Um, <clears throat> so this is, the, this is an exhibition of domestic cats. Uh, at Georgia Tech, I was uh, named the recipient of the Young Architects Forum Emerging, Emerging Architects Award, Emerging Voices Award, something. But I get this phone call, and I was like, well, wait a minute, I didn't apply. What does that mean? And they said, well, you get to exhibit your work in this, in this gallery. And I was like, well, I don't have any work. And so uh, at the same time, I was working on the roof uh, project being opportunistic. Uh, the idea was like to double down on this massing model that I'm now going to talk about which massing models are usually uh, small and they're iterative. They're kind of the proto-architecture. You do many of them. Um, but my claim is like, can we scale the massing model up and like puff it up to a larger size? So these are the 16 massing models and they're measuring like five feet by three feet by three feet. Um, and so in the ne next slide, you'll see the kind of lessons learned from reading the banal and the ordinary into these like uh, new massing models. And then the image on the right, these are the um, axonometric drawings where I'm just focusing on like the roof surface and like maybe a razzle dazzle condition. And so what happens when an A-frame uh, no longer fits snug with the adjoining gable <clears throat> or when a hip roof uh, no longer sits symmetrically as the primary volume. And so this is the top view of the 16 um, different roofs. So distortion, um, yeah, there's many manipulations and things being done to the originals. And then in terms of another layer of representation, uh, the two axons, uh, the one on the left is rep trying to represent the lines that our foam wire cutter uh, is, is cutting the, the foam. And so this body of work rethinks the role of the massing model in architectural representation. Uh, again, we're taking the small, the iterative process and scaling it up. We're often told when you scale up a model, you need to add more detail. I mean, that's what I was taught. Uh, that's what I probably teach. But in this case, what if you blow it up without windows, without more detail, without materials, and, and what do you kind of get? Um, domestic hats delights in these tendencies to engage multiples, but rejects the constraint of smallness. Um, they weren't easy to kind of transport uh, around. They didn't fit in our foam cutter, so we had to piece them together. Um, the massing models uh, aren't large enough to be considered a pavilion, um, nor would they sit comfortably on a client's coffee room table. They are inflated and they merely represent themselves, no longer a representational stand-in for something else. Um, during the exhibition, we're kind of lighting them differently. So in this case, this is like very top lit, so you really read the surface of the roof, but you also see the elevation and shadow and in this case, the elevation and the roof are, is, bo is both lit. <coughs> and after the exhibition was over, we took um, domestic hats back out into the city and dropped them off as yard art in front of the original houses where that we had sampled the roofs. And we were also trying to be political, and we wanted Michelle Nunn to get the U.S. Senate seat that year, which didn't happen. So I made this the postcard of the exhibition and invited her to the opening. Um, and so you can see uh, kind of what the, the proposals look that, like right in front of the originals. This is one of those shotgun houses in, in Cabbage Town. And this is one of my favorite ones because 
you know, the kind of scaled up massing model, you know, the wood framing with the plywood, it's kind of, they're meeting their match, you know, with the domestic cat sitting on the front porch there. The second model is the dollhouse model, which is uh, traditionally scaled at 1 to 12. Um, so if the, uh, the first model is definitely concerned with representation, <clears throat> this model is also concerned with representation, but I'm adding in more kind of ingredients, and that would be <clears throat> one, materials, and the possibility for the roof plan that I was mentioning. So this is the dollhouse. Um, and uh, it's made out of birch, uh, Baltic birch plywood. Uh, this is the moment where, you know, what if we start to um, <clears throat> kind of propose moving away from the free plan or the ROM plan and kind of promoting the roof plan. And you can see in the, the two plans, the top one is the first floor and the, the bottom one is the uh, top floor, second level of the house. <clears throat> so if you look at the top floor plan, you can't really see that it's affected by the roof, but actually, and you'll see it in the picture shortly, uh, there's two double height spaces. And then I've drawn the roof lines onto the plan here so you can see uh, how things are aligning and where ridge lines meet at corners, et cetera. And so I think the promise of the roof plan is that you can have these roof rooms. So on the uh, far left, the section, that room is a bedroom. It's actually being structurally held by the roof above. And so the roof uh, starts to make spaces. And then in terms of materiality, uh, you know, how could we uh, apply materials to this interior? So I meant to say that the cross laminated timber is the, it represented here as the uh, birch plywood, Baltic birch. Um, but instead of cutting the dollhouse up into the 87 panels that makes the house, the idea was to cut a seam right in the middle and use brass hinges and open it up. So not to like tectonically try to represent it yet, that will happen digitally in the computer. Um, and then yeah, using the colored light again from uh, what I learned in Still Life and Barbara Caston's work to think about how these materials start to make uh, space. Um, <clears throat> and then obviously this project is cited in the American South uh, and it undertakes an old tradition of faux finishing. And for Southerners, uh, there's a history of not being able to afford precious materials um, with the subsequent desire of faking it. Um, so seen here on the left, this is the Southern Institute of Faux Finishing. This is a real place in Brandon, Mississippi. Um, I haven't been there. I don't know if anyone has. Uh, I want to go. Um, but the, the ambition is on the right, which is a porcelain bathtub that's um, been kind of decked out in faux marble painting on the, exterior, on the outside. And so the idea is how can foam finishes both be uh, on the exterior of house gables and also be used on the interior? So if we're making a faux brick pattern, how, what does that look like at the scale of 55 feet long elevation? And here pointing back to art practice, um, we were, I was looking at Mary Course's white light paintings from 1968 where for the first time uh, an artist is painting with glass beads. These are the glass beads that are used in roadways um, for the reflective markers. Um, and so these are our tools. One of them's kind of digital. It, um, it's a faux wood grain roller that we milled. And then the other one's kind of, uh, you know, just a stamp that looks like brick. And then the glass beads. Uh, so we made some mock-ups of this at one-to-one -one scale. This is a four-foot by four-foot panel that was um, exhibited at the Yi Yang Gallery in Boston. It's very hard to photograph, but this is the um, technique uh, on house gables installed. So on the left is me taking a picture of my phone at dusk, and on the right, same picture but with a flash. And so you see the reflectivity just like when your headlight of your car hits the road striping. You can kind of see it a little bit in this picture. Um, so just, before, just as I was trying to talk to subcontractors in Atlanta about how to do this, I called a few, and they're like, oh, we've done this on an Arby's uh, down the road. And so 
it was uh, kind of disheartening to hear that all this research that had taken place at Harvard was really like uh, not that, you know, it's been done before. Um, but what I, Arby's, which is fake bricks, this is not real white bricks, um, but what Arby's doesn't have that House Gable has is this kind of uh, glitter, um, which I'll show in a minute. But this is, uh, it's a product actually, so it's a sticker. Um, and it uh, makes it look like grout, and so they stick the sticker on uh, for the whole facade. They trowel on the last layer, and then they remove the sticker. But uh, when they trowel on the last layer, they use a hopper and blow in uh, thousands of glass beads, which is the glitter. And so that's the kind of dash finish um, that creates the uh, glitter stucco reference. And then for the interior, the faux finishes uh, both happen on a room by room basis and also uh, make space such as like the catwalk or um, there's no real corridor or hallway in the house. Um, but the idea is that it would both be the finished floor material and then also transfer up the walls into like a kind of a wainscoting. So these are the drawings that uh, were done in tandem with the dollhouse. So the, I, even though these are drawings, I see them as like dollhouse drawings. Uh, these are the plans. And so the idea when I mean faux finish, in the, in the kitchen, there, that's the black terrazzo. Terrazzo is usually uh, poured in place and polished. Um, this is a tile now, because terrazzo is on trend. You can just buy a tile that's like you know, a quarter of an inch thick. Uh, and that would be beside a material that's more cheaper, like um, a vinyl surface, which is the yellow. And so that yellow vinyl surface is traditionally used in hospitals, um, and it kind of looks like marbling. Um, and then that would be beside uh, the bathroom, which has a kind of cartoon drawing of marble. And so in all these corners of the house, there's kind of two to three materials being mashed up. This is the second level um, floor plan. And so the gray terrazzo travels up the staircase, floods the kind of the landing area, and then um, uh, draws your attention towards the living room in, on the catwalk. And then this is the um, faux finish installed. Um, this is the gray terrazzo I was just mentioning. Um, this is one of my favorite views of the house, which is, this is that roof room I was mentioning in section. So, this is a bedroom that you can see the kind of traditional pitch of a, a child would draw, of like a house. Um, and that's very clear, and you can read it and see it. And that's being held by the roof above, which is acting as a folded plate. Um, and the faux finishes, uh, you know, I think misalign and then make strange connections uh, in perspectival views throughout the house. Uh, so that same gray terrazzo um, then kind of uh, touches uh, the living room, which is a blue vinyl rubber that looks kind of like confetti. Um, the bathrooms have the same two tiles, the pink and gray tile, but they're flipped. So downstairs, the pink is on top and the gray is on bottom. So there's a sectional faux finish happening um, between the two bedrooms. And this is a, a manufacturer out of Spain, and they've taken this very funny I think the Spanish are very uh, humorous. This is a kind of marble veining drawing of, uh, of marble that's like an image onto a ceramic tile. Um, this is the kitchen. And so the faux finishes in each room are, you can think of about it like a wedge. And so it might ramp up to be the backsplash on the counter area and then kind of die down to maybe like uh, 10 inches off the floor on the other side of the room. And this is where I was talking about two materials come together and the kind of color blocking that um, emerges. Um, before we move on to the one-to-one -one model, I just want to talk about the site for a minute. Um, this is in a neighborhood called Old Fourth Ward in Atlanta, and this kind of back area is a warehouse, and that warehouse is very long and butts up to something called the Beltline. The Beltline um, is a uh, walking pedestrian path 
a bicycle path that connects 45 neighborhoods in Atlanta as a former um, Rust Belt. Uh, and so the lots here are very uh, skinny. They're 24 feet wide. Um, and so with, your, with a three foot variant setback, you can only build 50, uh, sorry, 18 <coughs> feet wide. So it's 18 feet wide by 55 feet long. So the next neighbor would be uh, six feet away. Or it's being built right now, so that's happening at the moment. So the New York Times um, called uh, the Beltline a glorified sidewalk. I thought that was a little harsh. Uh, I know it's not the high line, but it's definitely um, kind of driving the way people use and operate the city. And in a city that's very hot, like people are actually walking and using it. And so everything I was talking about, eaves, valleys, uh, hips. I've thrown all of that out. This project that I'm trying to build is um, a pair of three gables, so six gables in total, not seven. And now we're at the one-to-one -one model. Um, uh, and so this is um, the construction uh, from the site camera as the CLT panels are being erected. And if you squint your eyes, don't fall asleep, but just squint your eyes, you can see this is where um, it kind of looks like a model that we would build on our desks, you know, that we, everything that we can cut um, into panels or walls, simulating walls that sit on our studio desk uh, can now be built and put together live one-to-one -one on site. Um, this is one of the first uh, CLT houses in the U.S. Obviously, it's been... Um, uh, being built in uh, Europe and Australia and um, Canada for years, um, but we're slow to take it on as like the single family house uh, model in the U.S. Uh, it, it required a 40 ton crane on the right. Uh, that's then picking up all the panels which are being delivered on the left. So piles and piles of panels are arriving on site. Um, there's four engineers uh, there was a team of four people that assembled this in 14 days. They flew in from Seattle. The first CLT house is uh, in Seattle by Susan Jones, uh, another female architect, um, and she recommended that I hire her super to come over and put this house together. Um, <clears throat> and so this was at the end of uh, one day. So kind of, it was kind of exciting because it looked like half the house was put together. Maybe this is like eight panels or so. So, you know, it was going good, it was going quick, and it very exciting. And this is where I think it looks like the foam core or chipboard model. Um, uh, and to say that the wood, the wood is being sourced from Austria, um, KLH is the manufacturer. Um, and so, preparing, so this is a steep learning curve. Uh, I had, this is my first built project. Um, so I, I wasn't really sure uh, where the electrical outlets needed to go. And all of that information needed to be baked in early uh, on into the digital model so that it could be, the electrical outlets could be routed into the panels uh, at the manufacturer. Um, so I'm kind of learning a lot uh, and taking on a lot of risk. Um, and I'll explain the risk in a moment. But, you know, when the installer's on site, uh, basically he didn't have, he wasn't going to use a computer because... This thing is kind of like an IKEA um, set that you can just uh, put the panels in order and they kind of go together like IKEA with uh, long screws, long fasteners. And so if there's 87 panels for the house, I made 87 drawings. Um, and this is the ordering system, panel 21, 22, et cetera. The engineers are then um, drawing their details on top, which is specifying the length of the screw, which ranges from four inches to 18 inches, and the drive angle uh, to connect the wall to roof. So there's a series of uh, details. Pretty much every angle is different, um, but it doesn't matter because it's all um, digitally uh, cut and manufactured. And so it literally just slides together on site with an eighth of an inch tolerance. And so these are, you know, kind of indicative of like the set, the erection sequence set. Um, so the, as I mentioned, the panels are in Austria. Uh, the structural concept structural engineer from London, London, Hanif Kara, sent over two engineers 
to the factory to inspect the panels before they were shipped. Um, and so, you know, this is the scale. You, they can cut 50 foot long panels now um, and is uh, nine feet wide, which is kind of simulating the truck bed. Um, the panels were put into three shipping containers and shipped over to the port of Savannah. Uh, and that's where we had to get, find 11 hotshot trailers uh, to p carry the panels over because an 18 wheeler we found out doesn't fit down the street. Um, and so it was all very tight logistics. Usually architects don't get involved in the um, kind of logistics of delivery, but that became my main project for two weeks, uh, which was the order in which to stack them so that when you picked it off, panel on the top went on the bottom and the last panel could just go straight into the house and be set. Um, and these are some of the um, angles and some of the uh, fabrication details of um, uh, all the geometry. So every panel was flip milled and it was there, they have the capacity there to cut the entire house in one day. So it's pretty impressive. Um, this is Terry Ducott, who is the installer. He's very happy right here. I don't think he had gotten to the roof yet. Piles and piles of CLT. I'm a very big fan. This is another uh, quick, there's a lot of drone stuff coming up. But So the CLT panels are, uh, sorry, this is Terry installing the heaviest piece on the roof. This is a five ply. On the roof we're using five ply, so that's five layers of wood. Um, the walls are three ply, that's for the exterior walls and the interior walls. And then the floor plates are seven ply, um, and all of that's CLT box is kind of sitting on top of a concrete box. Um, the engineers that I worked with to do the uh, design assist package was from New Hampshire. They're called Bensonwood. They then work with an uh, engineer called Fire Tower, who's an expert in mass timber calculations. Uh, yeah, lots of planning. When I mentioned risk, um, say panel 27 didn't show up or there was something wrong with it or it wasn't cut how we wanted it to be, the angle was wrong, um, that would, I don't know what we had done, that would have been uh, kind of a disaster. We'd have to move the crane out, send the guys home, and wait for a panel to arrive. Um, here is uh, the work of John Portman in the background. Um, and I would say just to take on risk uh, is something that already kind of, I think, happens in John Portman's work and somebody that I was really looking to. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think, um, yeah, John Portman was building all of his buildings as developer and architect, and I think here, obviously, this is an experiment um, that's pushing CLT without a client, so this was uh, self-funded and uh, we took out a construction loan, my, my uh, family, my husband and I, and so, yeah, just a lot of risk. Uh, being taken on to try to pull something like this off. If you look straight up um, the top, there's like a gable over there, a little one. And if you look straight down, it's kind of aligning with that second gable on the house. And that wasn't planned at all by any means, but I think when you're working on the project of ordinary, those things and patterns start to emerge in the work because of the kind of starting point. Yeah, so this is uh, the one-to-one -one model, uh, fully built. So then there was about uh, one day, one afternoon that we had to photograph the, the kind of raw CLT as a structure before the general contractor needed to waterproof it and get the windows in. And so a local photographer took these photographs, which um, I'm, I'm really glad that we were able to capture because it shows all the like problems and the inconsistencies of uh, putting together these panels and how they get knocked around during the process. You'll have to remember the interior finish of the CLT panel is the final finish. Uh, and so you can see there's, you know, the, a lot of kind of nicks here. But what you do, it, wood is forgiving, and so you go through and you sand, um, sand the, the walls and uh, add a uh, stain and a sealant to them. But you can already start to see how the light is working in the house and um, how these, the roof plan, which is a 17 and a half foot 
uh, wide house on the interior. I, I think one of the promises of the roof plan is that you get these volumetric uh, interiors. So you're in a small footprint, but a big, big house. Uh, I worked with three photographers. I just showed you one. The second one is Tim Hursley out of Little Rock, Arkansas, who uh, had photographed my project at the Rural Studio and has been documenting the Rural Studio's work for uh, two and a half decades now. And so his idea was to t bring lights and light the house from the exterior. We're on that roof, uh, the roof of the warehouse just behind. Um, and this is one of my favorite shots of the house. Um, so he's lighting the house and so at the corner you can see the it's hard to see, but the fake brick is uh, one facade and then uh, just traditional stucco uh, on the back. And so you really see what's happening at the corner and you notice like, okay, these are fake bricks, this can't happen. But when you're spinning around Rhino so many times and knowing your project backwards and forwards, and then the architectural photographer comes and shows you this view that you haven't really seen yet, um, it's pretty exciting. And then he captured this photograph, which uh, again, if you squint your eyes, looks like one of the massing models from Domestic Cats. Um, and you can kind of see how it operates in the city, obviously with Portman, Portman super atriums in the background. This third photographer is from London called Naro, and uh, Marcella came and uh, photographs a lot of the interiors. And so you see how the CLT finishes up. It's like such a contrast from the kind of raw just after it being put together to the final. So it's kind of a soft Scandinavian kind of white wood. And the faux finishes is really trying to offset uh, it being a Scandinavian house. Again, this is a house built in Atlanta. And what I'm saying, uh, dirty ordinary or, or borrowing the rap terms, the dirty south. And so you get these 55 foot long views through the house where this bedroom has no door, but you're standing in a gray fake concrete room uh, looking at yellow and then the black terrazzo. And so you're getting this color block of space throughout the house. So it goes bedroom, dining room, kitchen. Um, and this is one of my favorite interior images that I think I sent you guys, which is uh, uh, Metropolis Magazine sent a journalist down from Chicago who uh, interviewed me for two hours, and he titled the article um, Playing House. And most people would be kind of offended, a female architect, uh, you know, she's just playing house. But actually, I think he kind of, through the article, totally nailed um, what I'm doing, which is taking the and those representational models and then literally dressing up to match the chair uh, and looking like kind of a scale figure inside the domestic interior. So the exterior is obviously white. There's the CLT interior with the colorful finishes. And then there's two other spaces in the house which are white, which is this exterior patio on the uh, second level. And then the second space is the garage, which is kind of, um, I think you notice, kind of sunken below. And here I didn't want it to feel like a garage, so everything's white, glossy finishes, paint, and uh, powder-coated uh, metal panels. Um, and so it's really trying to be a, a more like a gallery than a garage. Um, and I don't know if this is making a joke about the, maybe the roof's leaking above, I'm not sure. This is one of Tim Hursley's photographs, uh, just at dusk. I'm sorry, sunrise. And then uh, we'll finish here. I mean, a lot of people are then asking uh, what's happened to House Gables. Uh, and then, so basically, uh, it's being used as a rental property. Um, you'll have to look up Mulatto's video that she shot long way uh, recently. I can't show it, it's a little too risque, but um, it kind of uh, appeared in the beginning and throughout the, and then there was another uh, rapper called Black that came and uh, rented the house for eight days during uh, Music Midtown Festival. Um, and then he's taking his own photographs and then, uh, so I think uh, maybe I'll just end it there and I'm happy to take any questions, thank you.
Okay, so some people are leaving. Does anybody? Hello. Oh, you got a microphone. Good. Yep. Um, what do you, did that, did that like, give implications for you for like architecture or you believe there's like direct correlation? Like what's your perspective on that? I guess, I don't know. Yeah, so I, when I showed the Dirty South, that was a research studio option, uh, a graduate studio at Georgia Tech. And there I'm just kind of like making an observation, you know, this thing happened in the mid 90s and I didn't make a full on presentation of it tonight, but um, sometimes I bring it in like I showed it recently in Arkansas because I knew the students would like kind of understand um, where that was coming from. Uh, and basically, if you think about it, the rappers on the East Coast are the lyricists, uh, and their words and their rhymes really are flowing and saying a particular thing. The West Coast rappers, uh, they're more talking about how they feel and like the pain and violence of like um, uh, the riots that were happening. And then when Goody Mob and Outkast, you know, first came onto the scene, they um, had a different accent, they were doing things differently, and they um, kind of d redirected the attention to the South and all their albums like outsold record sales for the East and West Coast rappers and they kind of defined themselves. And so I, I'm sure you guys are in a similar situation in the Midwest where it's like uh, everybody references East Coast uh, architecture, New York, Boston, or you know Los Angeles or California and it's like, how can we uh, kind of, I don't know, borrow from the hip hop industry and like kind of own like our creativity um, in the South or in the Midwest, right? Um, what was the name of the book again? Um, uh, a Guide to the Dirty South, Atlanta. That's the one that's on Upstairs? No. They're all asleep. No. They're awake. So, can you ask that question? What happens next with this feeling that you believe pushes further and that kind of like false material? What happens with you with that? Yeah, so I'm doing this kind of lecture series tour because I'm trying to really reflect on what the next project should be. So should I take the knowledge of the CLT that I've learned and, you know, a steep learning curve and do I use it again? Um, I'm interested in building one, one more single family house on the West Coast. So same proportions, same process, uh, different roof, which would mean different plan and different uh, interior, but same kind of proportions. Um, and I was thinking that that one would be black, and then we'd have, you know, the, it's like a sister house to the uh, house in Atlanta. And then, yeah, I think um, in terms of financially, the CLT for a single family house isn't really working out because um, I think at the scale of maybe multifamily housing, you might could drive the cost down and the numbers down where it actually works price per square foot. Oh, which would be, make it more affordable. Um, so yeah, there's an interest in like, could we do 40 units um, with with the same roof roof plan strategy and with CLT? Nope, nothing. I mean, I personally check the Rhino model and. Uh, the geometry I was getting from Austria with my pa original panels and like basically putting them on top of each other and like going around with, you know, just obsessing over it. I think I checked them like seven times, like trying to find errors or mistakes or something um, because I was so nervous that, like it's just so difficult to just push the final like send button, you know? Um, yeah. Oh. But 
But they didn't see the lecture. Oh, they saw it. Well, this is exciting, isn't it? Yes, but it's not here yet. So, any other questions? One more in this one. Yeah, so one room, if you think about the terrazzo tile, it's cold, right? And you're in the south, so you want to be kind of cool most of the year. So you step on it, it's, when you step on a vinyl, like it's, uh, it's warmer. And so that you just get like totally different changes in terms of texture, just like walking or being in the different rooms. I was, I had a hunch that I could save money by taking the cheap materials, like the vinyls and the fake wood, you know, that you can buy from like Home Depot or whatever. But I, I didn't save much money on this house, to be honest. So no, it didn't really play out. But the, the, the ambition was there to um, mix cheap, ordinary vinyls with more expensive, like those, that tile from Spain, you know, that costs a little bit to get over. Uh, wall, well, I need the plan probably. Oh, I could use show this one. So yeah, this, um, this wall, there wasn't many f walls on the first floor plan. It's just this like little box, which holds like a, a closet and um, the bathroom. And so that one is uh, load bearing, but that's really the only interior load bearing wall. I mean, the exterior ones are obviously load bearing. Um, I mean, I think I already said it, like the, you can hang things from the roof because it's a folded plate. And so you can do a lot of structural gymnastics. Again, this is only 18 feet wide. So the span is not difficult at all. And yeah, I think you can do even more than what I did with, um, with this material. So it's really a, a structural innovation and very <coughs> exciting for architects to use. And, and people are trying to see how to push it, I think, a lot now in the U.S. Where's the students that, inter that I talked to this morning or in the lunch? I'm sure they have a burning question. It's all flat, but yeah, but when I've heard that people ask, like, is there a slant to the, first? and like, no, it's all flat, but I think because of the, the finishes and the way that the material is, you know, uh, not level and it has an angle to it, I think. Yeah, somebody said, oh, I feel sick being in here, but I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Oh, good, good. I said it all during the interview. It's like kind of.